Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. Today is a very special episode. Because this episode takes place at So Black at Quilt Con in Atlanta, Georgia in 2023 in front of a live studio audience at the So Black space. And guess who we're talking with? The keynote, Sean Kimber. Let's give it up. Let's get some applause. I am so happy you are here. I'm so happy to be here. Your lecture is sold out. And yay. 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 <laughs> and guess what? We get to have you to ourselves. And I'm yes. grateful for you being here with us. Yes. I thank you for saying yes. Although you do say you say, I say yes to everything. And I'm like, okay. Well, well maybe not everything. Maybe. But thank you for making this happen. I think this is very important. And it's a nice step ahead for QuiltCon. Thank you. This happened because I saw the photo after Latifah's keynote last year, and it was a group of black women. I saw that photo and I said, there are black women at QuiltCon and I have a safe place for my heart to land. Mm -hmm. And I would prefer us all to be in the same space because I don't want to have to look around for everybody. So let's have a room. And here we are. And I'm thankful. It seems to be working out well. We're jam packed in a teeny tiny room and we're, we're doing great in here. Sean. Yes. You do a wonderful job of mixing mathematics and design. Okay. I don't think I do. You but don't? That's fine. You don't? No. Okay. So that's a good place to start. Yes. So, tell us what you do then. Now, so my handle, Koshi Complete, is because I joined social media back in 2005 and did not want anybody to know it was me. And who is going to suspect that a mathem- dead mathematician's name it refers to this little brown woman? And so, great, I was hidden for a long, long time. Um, but it's also a very clever math turn of phrase that I won't teach you because there's no chalkboard. Thank goodness for you. Okay, um, so I would say that I started quilting as a way to escape the mathematics I had to do every hour of every day. Right. And so, yes, I do some geometry, but that to me is not... Not real math. It's not, it's not hard math, right? And the reason why I do improvisation is because I don't have to consider any of that at all, yes. ever. And so I think that my work is pretty much divorced from mathematics to the extent possible. Can you talk a bit about I Miss Hope? Mm-hmm. What does that piece bring? What was, as you were, and I know you, t- you do a lot of things by hand. You do a lot of things in very small. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about scale and the scale of I Miss Hope? So those are two questions. So I'm going to try to remember the second question while I answer the first one, but you've got my back. So I Miss Hope. I was, I made that in 2016, starting it shortly after a certain presidential election. Mm. Um, the Obamas, right? This whole spirit was hope and change, hope and change. And as that presidency got off the ground, the one following the hope and change, mm. I reflected a lot on how much my hope had been just completely draining out of me. Yeah. But I also had to reflect that it it was coming at a certain period of my life. Hmm. I finally had to admit that I'm middle-aged. I mean, when do you realize that? And how does My knees told me. Yeah, well, yeah. mm -hmm. And many other things, Mm -hmm. yes. Um, But for me, it was, I, it manifested as truly feeling that I could not have the same level of hope that I had when I was a child, right? Mm. So in your 20s, you can have all the hope in the world because you've got forever to achieve every possible dream. 
And now I have to admit that, okay, I can't do everything that was on my bucket list. And so I have to prioritize and pick and choose and not necessarily carry every dream with me and start leaving some of those behind. Mm. And so this patchwork is tiny because that's just what I do. I don't know how to do big pieces. And I think we all have different definitions of big and (laughs) big is very small for me. So, Mm -hmm. but working it over and over with all that stitchery to do the quilting was about the frustration and the tension of following the news. Like we had to follow the news every day because you didn't know how we were going to get attacked on any particular Mm, day mm. and what new defense we would need to mount. And it was getting to me. But Mm. every day I go home at night and just stitch a few more squares and and just rage quilt. Yes. But it's really about being old. (laughs) Thank you. That's a that's a beautiful answer. I wanted to think about the intersection of quilting and activism. There are mm-hmm. folks who often I, I think you showed you showed a recent photo, a recent cover photo from the I think the L.A. Times yeah. um, at a recent quilt con from, you know, the 10 years. Mm-hmm. And this was you. And I think the, the the headline was something like stitching activism or something like that. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a bit about your process or your your thinking that the I miss hope? is about, you know, Agent Orange. It's also about, like, you know, aging and development. It's about all these other things. Yeah. Does that also work for quilts like I Can't Breathe or some of the mm-hmm. other ones? Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, quilting and activism, which seem like these are two, these are false binaries, right? Yeah. Because yeah. these things that cross a lot. But talk about that, about that kind of bifurcation and why bifurcation is dangerous. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's important to note that I... And very careful about the words that I use. So even though every quilt is associated with a particular current event and time, you don't have to know the specifics of that event in order to interact with my quilt. So I'm trying to make the most universal statement that I can that's timeless in a way. So uh, I can't breathe is kind of in a different category because it just keeps happening Mm. over and over again. That one will never lose its uh, reference point Mm. uh, because it just keeps getting new reference points. Mm -hmm. Um, But something like uh, I Miss Hope um, is I don't want to ever make a quilt about a particular politician Mm. because that's giving them the power. Yes. I want to make a quilt about how that politician impacts me, Mm. how that politician is impacting my people. Mm -hmm. How do we feel in this moment? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of a timeless feeling. It's not particular to that moment, although we didn't have it for the eight years prior, but Mm. um, it's now becoming our new normal though, Mm. unfortunately. Mm. So, And I really appreciate the way that the statement quilt or someone might call call it a statement quilt is a kind of, is a larger universal question. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciate the risks you take or do you define them as risks? There are some who might look at your work and say, wow, she takes a lot of risks and this could be aesthetically, it could be content or whatever, but do you describe, do you think about your work as risky? Does it feel risky to you? Yes, absolutely. Um, Because you never know how it will be received. Mm. I take pains to make sure I'm not saying something wrong. Mm. I have a feeling some of you have experienced quilts where the thing that was said just hits you the wrong way. There are some pretty offensive statement quilts out there um, where the quilters were quite well-meaning but did not take the time or the effort or listen to any advice they might have gotten about that statement. And I just, it's... It's not something you do on a whim. Mm. I think it's if you're going to make a statement and you're going to put it out there for public consumption, I feel like you have to be careful about how you do it, how it's going to impact every possible member of your audience. Mm. And so um, I use I use my social media to work up to the reveal, Mm. slowly putting, you know, little articles in my stories say, go go learn about this event over here so that you're going to get the reference I'm going to make. 
And then I'm contacting all kinds of friends and family Mm -hmm. and engaging in conversations about those events Mm -hmm. or about that general feeling or about our ancestors (laughs) to make sure that I have as clear of an understanding as I possibly can have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am not perfect, but Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to get as close to the least offensive, Mm -hmm. the most direct, Mm -hmm the most capable of opening doors for people to start learning if they are willing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I try, but the risk is always going to be there. Yes. You were recently, I think last year, I saw that you were featured by Scholastic. Yeah. And that to me was a superstar moment because I was a Scholastic Book Fair girl when the the Scholastic Book Fair paper came home. I had like, I'm telling you, I was the kid that begged to go to summer school because it was indoors with books instead of camp. Can you talk about that, about how they approached you? What was it like to be featured as a great model for so many young people? I have to admit, I didn't know that book came out, by the way. (laughs) Um, I was called about that maybe two or three years ago. I mean, I was in the middle of, no, I was in my office when I got the phone call. So it was pre-COVID when I got that call. Um, And it was just these two education professors out west somewhere. And um, they just said, we like your story. We want to tell the story. Um, Here's how we approach different age groups, because clearly I don't know anything about kids. Uh, that is absolutely true. I can talk to an 18 to 22 year old. Fine. That's where I'm highly practiced. But a elementary school kid, I have no idea to f- how to frame a story for them. And so I was actually just a super nerd, truly excited to be learning from these two professors about how they were going to project the story into the world. What are the best dimensions of my story that could be told that would truly illustrate my life without going into, you know, the dirty details Mm. of anything, but really encapsulate things. And so it really was just these, it was an email and a phone call. And so now I got to find this book. Well, I don't know if it's out or not. I just remember when you posted about it and I was just. Oh, that wasn't a book. Oh, that that, that, I meant that. Yeah. So tell us about that project. Okay. So she has so many. It's like, oh, wait, which scholastic project did you mean? Yeah. I'm sorry. (laughs) But that's going to be a cool book when it comes out. So it's going to be a book for young brown women. About you and your work as a mathematician. Math. Yeah. Um, So. But this other thing, the black girl math, math, jick, math, jick, yes, math, hyphen, jick, math, jick. Um, that is a, uh, a subscription box, uh, but they come in purple, a purple box in the mail. And every, I think it's every other month, she profiles a black woman in mathematics. She makes a booklet in there that is the story of the uh, mathematician that she's profiling Um, and then it also contains math problems based on characteristics of your life and so quilting was a really great kind of angle for her to take so So it's all areas and counting of pieces of fabric Mm -hmm. and kind of cool stuff and then the rest of the box is filled with relevant toys and so there's all of these um, sort of magnets of different shapes. And so you can make a quilt on your refrigerator and all kinds of other little cute toys inside. And so it's my box. They uh, took a photo of me and turned it into a cartoon. So I'm now a cartoon character. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is fantastic. Now, yeah. I saw your quilt at the Renwick last summer. Yeah. Um, and it was a really wonderful exhibition. Um, Bisa Butler had pieces there. Um, Sonia Clark. Mm-hmm. Um, quite a few folks had some really remarkable pieces. Yeah. Can you talk about that process? Like, what is it like when a museum acquires your work? Is it a lot of things involved? What does it require to, on your part as an artist, to release it in that way? Mm-hmm. Or do you consider them loans? They buy them? Like, how do you... How do you manage that in terms of your um, your like when you're ready to release something in that Mm -hmm. way? So the process is different with different museums. Some of them just come at you and say, here's what we have to spend. What can you give us at this price? Mm. Sometimes it's 
nothing. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> uh, and over time, your price increases, of course. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So the Renwick was special because they were they were celebrating their 50th anniversary. Mm-hmm. And so they had some intention to do a lot of fundraising. Mm. And so part of that fundraising was to um, enhance the collection of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, specifically in areas where the collection was blank. Mm. And so essentially um, all makers except white males. Mm. And -hmm. I should say um, hetero white males. Yes. And so... The collection that you would see at the mm-hmm. Renwick right now is also oh black and oh. indigenous and Latin. Yes. Um, and it's um, quite eclectic and lovely. So that one uh, was probably three years before the exhibition began. I have this quilt godmother who is the best human. Um, and I'm not going to say her name here, but I'll say it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, she called me one day and she doesn't normally just pick up the phone and call me. So I knew something was going on. And all she said was, you're going to get a phone call. This is the number you should say. And then she hung up the phone. I had no idea what any of this meant. So for two weeks, I sat around just, was that some kind of CIA notification? <laughs> or <laughs> I just didn't know. And this call comes in. Um, first, an email from the curator, Mary Savig, um, at the Renwick. Um, hey, can we have a phone call? And I was like, oh, this might be the moment. <laughs> and she asked for that specific quilt, are you willing to sell it and what would be your price? And I was like, I have never, ever considered that this would be a price. Um, only a year before had I considered selling a quilt, right? Wow. And I was like, for that, I can make another one. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, uh. Um, And it it still astounds me to this day. And to know that, and and so she took the number and then she said, well, we have to go fundraise. Mm -hmm. They had to go and raise that dollar amount. But then consider they were collecting 180 new pieces. Mm. So they had to collect essentially that dollar amount for 180 new Mm -hmm. pieces. And so that just like blows my mind completely. But then it takes another two years, right? They're raising the money. Then you have to get, become a vendor for the United States of America. Oh, wow. And get approved and all that. And then a giant check shows up in the mail. Um, nice. And you do what you can to contain yourself. So, oh, that is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Congratulations. Thank That's, you. It's really beautiful. That what's most important to me is that America owns my quilt now. Yes. And had I not gotten that preliminary phone call of here's your dollar amount, I would have been $5 because that's what... It means to me that America owns my quilt. That kind of validation mm. of the work, the statement. Yeah. I don't even need the five dollars, but that's like towards the postage. Mm. So but I'm glad to take the big check too. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um I I, I really I think that's so valuable and what a great mentor. Um, Mm -hmm. someone to be willing to kind of share the behind the scenes because what you don't know what you don't know, you know, that when you're entering a specialized industry and there's certain vocabulary, certain language, certain meetings, certain relationships, all of these things get leveraged all around you, but you don't know. And so it's really wonderful. Do you, when you, when you, when you quoted that new rate, you know, because it was so a, a new process, did you feel like you had to kind of like, push yourself to do it or you were just like oh I'm like you know I'm just gonna do it I was I'm just gonna say it because she said did you, did you practice saying it did you practice the phone call did you say it? you know no I well I mean imposter syndrome definitely set mm. in I'm like is this like playing poker and like I'm gonna be out of the game because I'm saying a number that's too high and so shouldn't I go in with my usual mm. opening bet here <laughs> and I trust this godmother enough. Yes. Yes. And yeah. And you know what? I think just to continue the poker metaphor, Mm -hmm. you bet on yourself. Yep. And all of us win. Yeah. 
all of us won mm-hmm. because you bet on yourself. Yeah. And we're really grateful. I am really grateful. Mm-hmm. And speaking of grateful, you have 10, you have an exhibition downstairs of your work as part of the 10 year anniversary of QuiltCon. Mm-hmm. And it is a stunning, stunning retrospective. It's a really beautiful combination of um, the improvisation that you do as well as this the structure. And, and, and I hate to think, cause I remember we, we were on Instagram and I think someone had posted something about like, do you like statement quilts or do you like was beautiful? It? Oh, that's right. That was the binary. And Sean, like, I think reposted or commented on it and was like, do you remember what you said exactly? Yeah. And I, so I just sort of said, this is a strange binary that it was a nonprofit quilt group that were having people donate a dollar per vote as a fundraiser for them. And so if you wanted to vote on the best quilts or beautiful quilts, you could give your $20 and you would put in 20 votes for beautiful quilts. And the, but the other option was statement quilts as if these are separate categories of quilts. But it's also that even this category of statement quilts is, has always been a way to marginalize my work. Just Mm. to say my work is political. Therefore, it's not the same as everybody else's quilts. And therefore, it can't be beautiful in these people's binary. And so I made that comment that many of our BIPOC quilters Mm -hmm. who choose to make quilts about their identity Mm -hmm. are being relegated into this separate category. Mm. And then they want people to vote. And what are they going to do with this vote? What are they going to say? Oh, beautiful quilts are obviously the better quilts. And, you know, that wasn't all that I put in there. I just said, look, you are being divisive and you are marginalizing BIPOC makers. And to their credit, they immediately post reposted my post, said, hey, we're we're sorry that we held up this binary. But then they they left up the The money, the the money, the fundraiser um, until I think other people joined in (laughs) the choir. But um, I I screenshotted everything. So I'm ready to go. Um, I love that. I love that. And we're all learning and unlearning. Yeah. And that's a really important part, I think, of artistic development. Mm-hmm. Do you re- do you think that in the last, well, I guess maybe in the last, you think about your work in terms of like a decade, mm-hmm. um, as, since we're here at the 10th anniversary of QuiltCon, what do you see in your own work that has changed remarkably over the last decade? Is there anything that you can look back in your own retrospective and feel surprised by? No, I. so I'm, very intentional i have no time to be quilting anything so i am very intentional in the choices i make about which projects i indulge in Mm. and so i've been always super careful in making decisions before even launching into a project Mm. and so i i think that my intentionality means there's not a lot of surprises Mm -hmm. going on Mm -hmm. i would say that um I might be making more happy quilts lately Oh, uh, just because quilting was my happy place until I started making these statement quilts about rough stuff happening in the Ooh. world. And then quilting became a chore and a labor. Ooh. Um, sure. It's, it's, it's for the people, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at some point, I need to go back and feed Sean. I yes. need, I need the self care of quilting. Yes, you do. And how do I get that back? Well, Sometimes it's by making happy statements. Mm-hmm. Um, ooh, evil eye tub, <laughs> right? Our selfie quilt. Um, I, I think the, right, that just came out of nowhere. Um, it was, I remember there's a scene from Amadeus, if you ever saw that movie about Mozart, and he's flirting with his new girlfriend, and he's, you know, somehow supposed to be illustrating how smart he is uh, <laughs> because he starts speaking all of his sentences backwards. And so he says, to end sort of their tussle under the table, he says, ooh, evil eye tub. And he asks her to marry him. And I think it's Emiram. 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 (laughs) Right. And and I've always kind of reflected on, ooh, evil eye tub, because it doesn't sound like I love you. That whole tub part just doesn't kind of feel like it for me. Yeah. And so... I've always been kind of thinking about uh, the reflection in your camera when you take a Mm. selfie 
And unfortunately, a lot of cameras automatically reverse the image. So the selfie quilt doesn't work for everybody. You have to turn that off. Right. Um, but just this idea that you would take a selfie and then your photo would tell you it loves you. Huh. Right. And there's so much to unpack there. So I'll stop. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, that's really beautiful. That's really beautiful. I was thinking about the texture of your pieces. You were talking about the piece at the Renwick. It, you really mm-hmm. can't discern all of the richness and texture from a, from, a, from a distance. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how do you think about balance in your pieces since so much of it is improvisational? Mm-hmm. It, is that something about like, and I'm thinking balance between the texture of the piece mm-hmm. and the, the, the overall aesthetic, the yeah. overall frame of the quilt within the borders of the piece. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to quilt with it out not being dense. So mm. you can tell my lines are close together. Those X's are close together. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how to leave space. Whenever I leave space, I end up coming back through and filling it in with more lines and more X's. So mm-hmm. I think that's just the natural way that I quilt. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to fight that. Yeah. Because when I'm in a moment of quilting, I have the time to do it. And I'm just going to let my hands do what they mm-hmm, want to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we are in an age of social media where your art f- is first viewed through Instagram. Mm. And so there are some quilts that you make that do not look very good in an Instagram photo. Mm. Half of my quilts do not photograph well. And so There's this question we have to ask is, are you making your art for Instagram or are you making your art for the wall of a museum? And there's, but there's a connection because you're not going to get into the museum unless they notice your work. They're Uh. they're noticing your work through the projection you put out there. Mm. And so there's now this connection that unfortunately Apple phones are controlling up to some extent. Who gets now, in the museums? Obviously, though, I keep making these denim quilts that don't photograph well. Um, so I, I'm not buying into it completely. Some of my quilts, I'm like, yeah, it's going to look good on the gram. <laughs> but but I, I have to make some choices that, that way. There are mm-hmm. some quilts, right? So, ooh, evil eye tub. <laughs> I'm like stitching super close to my face because oh. I have to wear glasses because I'm a woman of a certain age and it is looking gorgeous up close, mm. right? But then I had no idea those pieces were so small if they were on a wall. Oh. But it actually reflects there's these really great walls mm. that are slightly disgusting. <laughs> but if you go to Europe, they're You'll see in the subway a wall where people discard their gum. I've, uh. And the gum is all different colors. And you get those different blobs of color all densely packed into a certain space. And it actually looks like those kinds of walls. Mm. And maybe that works for me. Ooh, evil eye tub. It's kind of a disgusting statement if you think through all the layers of the selfie quilt. Mm. And... It fits with that gum. Wow. Um, and But I had not necessarily intended it from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And probably I should have had bigger pieces if it was going to look good on a wall. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I don't care. That's right. I, and I love how you asked, are you creating the quilt for the Instagram or are you creating it for a museum wall? And could there be a third option where you're creating it for yourself? And I, and I'm wondering how much of your own like pleasure and joy, um, come through the creation process and how you balance those three things through. Yeah. So, I mean, today, these are the decisions I'm making, but in, you know, before like two or three years ago, yeah, I almost all the quilts I make were never intended. Hmm. to be at quilt con or to be in a museum Hmm. they were always just a way for me to process things a way to spend a saturday afternoon without Hmm. being out in the streets doing bad stuff (laughs) um and so i can't breathe for instance yeah i just made the words because i had to Hmm. i watched the eric garner video And I couldn't believe what I was watching. I suddenly realized that these are the words that 
with no disrespect meant, but these are also the words I wanted to be expressing about this moment. Mm. It's senseless. It's out of control. I can't breathe because I can't understand what is happening. Mm. And so I just decided to sit at my machine and make these words and experience making these words in the dark, in quiet. Mm. The only sound was this hum of my machine and just making the each phrase one at a time. I can't mm. breathe. And then feeling the weariness of doing that nine times, mm. right? We all know about making a lot of blocks over and over again, feeling that sensation of just tiring out. Mm. And I put a bit of stack in the corner of my room. It had served its purpose for the moment. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, two months later, you pull it out and you start to put together the words into the rectangular block that they sit in. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, you make the rest of the patchwork around it. Mm -hmm. And more and more people are getting killed by the police. Mm. So maybe this is a statement that needs to be seen by the world. Absolutely. And so, yeah. So, and I think I don't have the time to do that now. Mm. Now I am, my pressures are different. Yes. Right? So. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's really, that's really beautiful. The title of our episode is Patchwork to Power with Sean Kember. And I've been thinking a lot about Black women's liberatory stitching traditions. Mm -hmm. um, I teach a class called Sally Hemings University Connecting Threads, and it's a, a, a course that I've created where we do both art and crafts and critical study. Um, and students um, in class, we do certain in-class activities. At the end of the semester, they get, a, they get a gallery show, and it's just, you know, really wonderful. But I do believe that there is something in the stitch. I think there is something when you put that needle to that thread and you pull it through and you tie that knot mm -hmm. and you make that commitment. Can you talk a little bit about what that is like for you when you are stitching that together? Do you think about, do you have ideas about power, about liberation, about process? Do those things kind of come together for you through your process? Um, as you are building and stitching? Um, yeah, I mean, I, so even prior to the job I currently have, um, there's a certain sense in which being a math professor meant that I had no leg to stand on to comment on issues of race in the community, right? It was meant for professors like you because <sighs> you're qualified, you're, it's your expertise. And so you're supposed to stand up on the uh, administration building stairs and be the one <laughs> railing against. And I'm supposed to be the quiet mathematician in the corner just saying, they're there. <laughs> and so in some sense, my quilts became my voice. Mm. So if I couldn't have a voice on the campus, mm. well, I'll have a voice in the world instead. Amen. And yeah, I think that that's the way that I think about it. Is yeah, yeah. That's where the power comes from is sort of a more global effect yes, on people. Yes. Um, the act of sewing, well, you all know it's pretty dangerous. Don't you get a thrill from your rotary cutter and <laughs> successfully not cutting off a finger? Using that power tool of the sewing machine mm -hmm. that's just going chugga chugga. Yes. Chugga chugga, and you don't put a needle through your finger. That's true. Right? It's always a good day when that does not happen. Yeah. So there, I mean, but there's power even in just that pointy needle, hand yeah. needle that yeah. you thread and you, you know, put it through cotton. I love the sound of pulling cotton through cotton. Mm. Just that. Yeah. It's just. You know, for me, it's the way to con connect with a great grandmother that who died when I was two and a half. Mm. And but we still had her quilts on our beds in our house. Mm -hmm. They were my father's most prized possessions. Wow. And that was meaningful to me. Yes. And I, I'm going to carry that forever. Yes. And now you've been able to create these quilts that, like you say, are doing work in the world. 
They are absolutely doing work in the world. They are teaching and sharing things that folks might not have acquired otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always so glad to see your work anywhere, but I'm especially glad for the retrospective here. Mm -hmm. Sean Kimber, the slogan of the Stitch Please podcast is that we will help you get your stitch together. What This is a question that we ask every interviewee. Okay. And I would like to know what your words of wisdom would be for our audience. Well, how would you help oh, us? No. What, what, what would you tell us to help us get our stitch together? This is a lot of pressure. It is. <laughs> it is. It's, all, it's pressure for me, too, because they're all listening. I onboard new faculty members every semester. And the number one thing I tell them is to sleep. And... I want them to be healthy when they get tenure. I don't want them just to get tenure. And so the same for you. Take care of yourself. Self-care. Go to your doctors regularly. Dentists, right? You only get to keep the, the teeth that you floss. And take care of yourself. And there's nothing more important than sleep to that. So. Wow. Wow. That's profound. Thank you. You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out with, to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transcripts, and other things to strengthen the podcast. And finally, if financial support is not something you can do right now, you can really, really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them. So I know that not all podcasts um, directories or services allow for reviews but for those who do for those that have like a star rating or just ask for a few comments if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the Stitch Please podcast that is incredibly helpful thank you so much come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together